Welcome to Culture Wire. I'm your host, Meg Schiffler. October is National Arts and Humanities Month, and we're here at SOMART's Cultural Center, where they're currently preparing for one of the city's most beloved and anticipated celebrations, Day of the Dead. On this episode of Culture Wire, we'll learn more about this unique tradition with a visit to the Mission Cultural Center. And later, we'll pay a visit to the California Academy of Sciences, where world-renowned artist Maya Lin has just installed her final memorial. Whether I'm dematerializing an idea of a monument or creating a monument that's almost a collective idea of loss that can be built online, shared here, taken away with you on an iPod, it's a very different idea of what a memorial can be. Day of the Dead is a holiday when friends and family gather to pray for and honor the spirits of the dead. SOMART's Cultural Center and the Mission Cultural Center for Latino Arts host events and exhibitions that celebrate and explore this special tradition. Luis Cancel, Director of Cultural Affairs for San Francisco, recently visited the Mission Cultural Center, where he got a preview of this year's Day of the Dead arts programming from Center Director Jenny Rodriguez and SOMART's curator, Renee Yanez. He also met with curator James Mikas, whose collection of prints by famed Mexican cartoonists Jose Guadalupe Posada and Manuel Mania will be on view at the Mission Cultural Center. The San Francisco Arts Commission supports six cultural centers. These are art centers that are located throughout the city and that help to bring the arts and make the arts accessible to all San Franciscans. And today, we're gonna to be interviewing individuals associated with two of those cultural centers. So we'll start with Rene Yanez, who is the curator of SOMARTS, and then we'll be speaking with Jenny Rodriguez, the director of the Mission Cultural Center for Latino Arts. Our subject today is the Day of the Dead festivities that will be taking place in San Francisco. Rene, could you give us a little background on that? Well, Day of the Dead is celebrated in Mexico November 2nd. And here in the United States, people have been celebrating for over 30 years now. And basically, you uh, have ofrendas, you do altars with offerings to invite the dead to come and visit you. You put out the dead's favorite uh, uh, drink and uh, food, and you invite the spirits to come and visit you. And also there's processions to celebrate the spirits, celebrate the Day of the Dead here in the Mission District. Um, you know, 20, 30,000 people show up. And uh, I remember going to SOMART's last year mm -hmm. and visiting the installation that you uh, curated. That was quite a huge uh, uh, presentation. I really like SOMART's. It's a large space and uh, we can do very large installations and altars. So. Uh, uh, you know, we're very happy this year, too, that uh, we're taking a new way of uh, celebrating Day of the Dead. We're also remembering the living. Some of our artists have participated. Uh, some of them are going through some health issues. Now, uh, the exhibition that you will be mounting at, uh, yes. at SOMARTS mm -hmm. is actually opening well in advance of November 2nd. So there's yes. an exhibition. And what are the exhibition dates? It's um, October 16th, we open up, we're going to have music, we're going to have a uh, celebration, and we close November 7th. It's located on Brennan Street. It's Brennan, 934 Brennan, between 8th and 9th, and uh, it's quite a large space, uh, and uh, that allows us to experiment and, and do some quite amaz amazing installations there. Now, the, uh, I know that there's certain iconographic images that you know, we associate with the Day of the Dead uh, celebration. Uh, you have the, uh, the cut paper, the papel picado mm -hmm. tradition, right? Um, there is a lot of uh, skulls that, you know, that, are, that are used in costumes and in, in candy. I mean, it's, uh, uh, can you talk about the significance of the skull, for instance? And well, uh, the sugar skulls is inviting the spirits to come and eat the sugar skulls and you put the name of the person 
in, in the sugar skull. The candles are to light the way, uh, so they find the way to the altar. The, um, the water, you have an offering of water after the journey, so they can quench their thirst. So everything's significant. Sometimes you'll put a beer that that per particular person like to drink. If that person smoked, you put the brand of cigarettes. So everything has a significance. You have the picture, the papel picado is to liven up the altar, so uh, it looks uh, alegre. So it looks, you know, it's not a sad thing. It's uh, it's not a ghoulish thing. It's a celebration. So, um, Rene, and, and sort of to finalize, uh, give me a highlight of what it's going to be uh, on the, uh, you know, November second. Well, um, we open on October 16th, and we're going to have music and a celebration. And on November 2nd, there's, there's going to be a procession, Garfield Park, and uh, even though the uh, Mission Cultural Center opens on the 15th, it's when on November 2nd is celebrated. They have crowds, they have tables outside with t-shirts, so it's going to be uh, quite exciting, like every year we get uh, thousands of people turning out for it. Rene, thank you so much for being thank on Culture Wire. Thank you for having Wire. us. Thank you very much. The Mission Cultural Center for Latino Arts is one of the cultural centers supported by the San Francisco Arts Commission. And joining me today is the director for the past 12 years of the center, Jenny Rodriguez. Hola, Luis. Hi, Luis. How are you doing? I'm fine. Well, we're really excited to be here in your gallery space and uh, looking at the preparations taking place with the Day of the Dead, uh, your Day of the Dead exhibition that's coming up. Um, over those 12 years that you've been here, how has that exhibition sort of evolved? The precursor of this um, procession were the rallies that were formed by the community activists and the community in response to the wars in Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Guatemala. So that kind of developed and galvanized the community towards getting together and celebrating and for a common cause. And that one thing led to the other, and that how, that's how the, the Day of the Dead procession started here in the mission. Amongst all of the different activities that, that you could see, uh, you have artisans actually creating masks and skulls, right? Uh, you have um, other people making the sugared uh, skulls, uh -huh. uh, which people then can, can purchase. Uh, you've got dancers, performers. Can you, is, are we expecting the same uh, this year? We open our doors at about um, seven o'clock at night, and we have several things happening here. So you have, like you said, uh, mass carving, we have sugar skulls make demonstrations. Usually these artisans come from Mexico, direct from Mexico, and they come every year just to come, you know, and, and share their, their work with uh, different other organizations, and they also always come to Mission Cultural Center. So we have that day also Danza Azteca from our very own group that rehearses here every, every single week. Now, how many artists uh, will be participating in your exhibition? Well, this year we're going to have two separate um, things happening. We're going to have um, close to nine big altars that are communal art, um, altars. We're having close to 25 to 30 artists participating in these nine altars, which are they have element, um, um, traditional elements, but at the same time, they are contemporary. So these are very, every year is, is a different kind you know, of, of, of experiment that we have here. And then we have in the Inti Raimi, our smaller gallery called Puerta del Sol. We have a very special exhibit this year, which is the work from Manila uh, and from uh, Posada. We're working with the curator, Jim Nikas, who has a special collection that he, you know, is, is making available so that the community can enjoy it. He happens to be here precisely finalizing the details of the exhibit, so I'm pretty sure he'll be more than glad to talk a little bit about, you know, the exhibit itself. So Jim, I'm very excited about this exhibition you're bringing over to the Mission Cultural Center. Uh, these are original prints from Jose Guadalupe Posada and uh, Manuel Manilla. So tell me, uh, how did you get these prints? They originated in Mexico City, and they came through uh, an association of my former business partner, Ernesto Roveto, who was friends with the grandson of the founder of the printing house of Venegas Arroyo, which began in 1880. Many of the uh, items that will be on exhibit um, 
uh, during this exhibition is they're broadsides, right? They're, they're a combination of text and images that were, now were the stories written by Posada as well? No, they were, they were influenced, the, the, the visual story of the image is written by Posada or created by Posada and Mania. But the text is often uh, the handiwork of uh, a number of writers that uh, the Negus Arroyo had, had and of course his editorial pen involved. And so th this exhibition and, uh, and your selection um, relates to the Day of the Dead celebrations uh, in what particular way? Well, we probably don't have enough time to go, but I'll try to give the best one, and that is that it, it puts it in context of our own mortality. It connects us to this period of time, which for most of us is well beyond even many of our grandparents' uh, initial walking stages. But uh, we're, all, we're all here on this planet for a very short time, and we share a lot of things. Posada is telling us Death strikes everybody. It doesn't matter who you are. It's the great equalizer. But now we share our lives together and in many different circumstances. How do you choose to do that? And he gives us a lot of graphic rep representations of the political aspects of, of that or just the socialization aspects of it. It's a very now, rich history. It, yeah, it's a, it's a phenomenal collection. I'm well aware of how historic this is. This is a great opportunity and, uh, and very generous of you to be sharing your collection with uh, San Francisco. So for all of you viewing here at Cultural Wire, uh, Soul Marts and the Mission Cultural Center for Latino Arts are celebrating in October, starting from the middle of the month, these two phenomenal exhibitions following the traditions of the Day of the Dead. So we do hope you will take the time to come visit them. Uh, and then of course on November 2nd is the big celebration. To learn more about all of the Day of the Dead activities at SOMART and Mission Cultural Center, visit their websites. Last September, the Arts Commission's Public Art Program achieved a major milestone when it added a new sculpture by world-renowned artist Maya Lin to the city's civic art collection. Installed above the terrace of the California Academy of Sciences, where the land meets the sea, is a wire sculpture that reveals the topography of San Francisco Bay. Over the last year, the artist continued to work on the second part of her commission, a project dedicated to raising awareness about biodiversity and habitat loss. Best known for her Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C., Maya Lin is a dedicated environmentalist who has consistently focused on environmental issues and promoted sustainable design in both her architecture and art practices. This September, a week shy of the Academy's one-year anniversary, the public art program made history again with the international debut of Maya Lin's last memorial and first multimedia project. Entitled, What is Missing? The sculpture is the first component of a multi-sided, multimedia artwork dedicated to raising awareness about current environmental issues. The Academy is the only institution in the world to house two permanent Maya Lin sculptures. To mark this historic occasion, the dedication ceremony was held in Maya Lin's honor, and Culture Wire was there to capture it. So what if you could make a memorial that is actually more about information and that you're never fixed and it can go wherever it wants to go. And everyone who's donated to it, they could use it, they could host it, they could share it. For quite a great deal of time, I mean, she was hired in 2005, she struggled with finding the correct and appropriate visual expression. It was a bench at one point, it was a, a darkened room at another point, but the theme always was a theme of how do we call people's attention to the issue of species extinction. We can, and many museum exhibits do make long, you know, detailed displays about species declines and the biology of birds and so on. And that's very useful for lots of purposes, but I think it's also important to, to try to pull at the strings inside people. Missing is not just about specific extinct or endangered species. It's about, an, it's about absence. 
and it's about a more fundamental level of not knowing what we're losing and that we need to link species loss to habitat loss and really focus as much on the habitat. Of course, the overall mission of the Academy has to do with two really fundamental and important questions. One of which is the nature of life. How did we get here? And the second is the challenge of sustainability. If we're here, how are we going to find a way to stay? And these questions resonated very strongly with Maya. On average, a species disappears every 20 minutes. This is the only media work that I've done. I might never do another one because I'm not a media artist per se, but I've used the medium because it seemed to be the one that could allow me to convey the sounds and the images here. Memorials to me are different from artworks. They are artistic, but memorials have a function. It's a beautiful sculptural object made from bronze and um, lined with recycled redwood from water tanks uh, in uh, Clear Lake. And that is the sculptural form that gives expression to Maya's project. If you think about a cone or a bullhorn, they're used to get the attention of a crowd, often to communicate an important message. This project has a very important message, and it's about our Earth and what we're losing and what we're missing and what we don't even know is gone. So what is missing is starting with an idea of loss. But in a funny way, the shape of this cone is, um, whether you want to call it like the megaphone, the RCA Victor dog, it's listen to the earth. And what if we could create a portal that could um, look at the past, the present, and the future? You can change what is in missing uh, by changing the software, by changing what is projected and missing. And so missing isn't a static uh, installation. It's, it's an installation that's going to grow and change over time. And she has worked to bring all of this information together from laboratory after laboratory, including, fortunately, our great group of researchers here at the California Academy into what has become missing. This art couldn't have been more site-specific to this place. And we also think just visually, um, in terms of its sculptural form, it really holds its own against the architectural largesse and grandeur of the Renzo Piano building. It's an unusual, compelling object. We think it'll draw people out onto the terrace. They'll see this big cone and say, what is that? And then they'll, as they approach the cone, they'll hear these very unusual sounds that were obtained from the Cornell Ornithology Lab. We have the world's largest repository of natural sound recordings of birds and mammals and frogs and insects, and also a huge library of videos. And uh, so this was an absolutely perfect opportunity for us to team up with a world-renowned, very creative, inspirational artist and put the sounds and sights of the animals that we study into a brand new context, a context that really allows people to appreciate in an aesthetic and thoughtful way the idea that we might live in a world without these sounds or without these beautiful sights. In the scientific realm, it's called shifting baselines, where we just keep getting used to less and less diminished expectations of what it was. And when I came across the passage of lobsters six feet long, oysters that were 12 inches that came out of New York Harbor, that within three days, all of the oyster beds in New York, Manhattan, the harbor, would clean the water. And so just getting people to wake up to what was just literally there 200 years ago, 150 years ago. You, you see this object, you say, what is that? You come out, you hear these intriguing sounds, sounds like I've never heard in my life. And, um, and then you step closer and you, you almost have a very intimate experience. We could link to different institutions around the globe maybe one per continent, maybe two or three in this country. And then once they're all networked, they begin to communicate with one another and share information. In 2010, the website will launch, but it will be what you would call an informational website. And then we're going to try to, by 2011, invite people to add a memory. So in a funny way, the memorial grows 
and there's some there's something organic about how this memorial begins to have legs, so to speak. So we don't know quite where it'll go, but I've promised to keep on it for 10 years, from 2010 to 2020. My goal is to raise awareness and then either protect forests from being cut down or reforest in ways that promote biodiversity. Biodiversity is often argued to be important for the world's human populations because of all the medicinal plants and the, the uses that we can put to it and the fiber that it gives us and the food that it gives us. And while these are vital and important and they're worth literally hundreds of billions of dollars, the part that we also have to be able to communicate is the more spiritual sense of how important it is that we get to live side by side with all of these forms that have three billion years of history behind them and how tragic it would be not commercially and not in a utilitarian way, but in an emotional, psychological, spiritual way if we watch them one by one disappear. This is really, it's sort of a merger between art and science and advocacy in a funny way, getting people to wake up and realize what's going on. And in that sense, it's, it's very much a memorial and it's trying to get us to understand and interpret history and to look at the past. And to me, the memorials have always been about looking at the past so that we proceed forward and maybe we don't commit the same mistakes. Be sure to pay a visit to the Academy of Sciences to experience what is missing. The artist encourages you to climb in and get a closer look. But before you do, take off your shoes. To follow the project's changes and additions, visit whatismissing.net. Earlier on this episode, we took you to the Mission Cultural Center, and last month we visited the African American Art and Culture Complex. Right now I'm standing in another one of San Francisco's city-owned neighborhood art centers. The SOMARTS Cultural Center was founded in 1979 to provide our local artists with classes, gallery space, and technical support. SOMARTS has been a partner to large events such as ArtSpan's Open Studios, Kearney Street Workshop, and the National Queer Arts Festival. I'm delighted to be joined by SOMARTS director Lex Leifheit to learn more about upcoming events. Around me, what you see is an exhibition by the Asian American Women Artists Association. One of my favorites is Cheers to Muses, which is a variety of sculpture, uh, paintings, and photographs in which the artists not only show their own work, but talk about the muses, the artistic muses who inspired them. Coming up, SOMARTS has a variety of exhibitions celebrating diversity and performances, and every first Thursday, we have an opening in our main gallery. What kinds of organizations uh, utilize your affordable space program there's a huge range. Last week, Desperate Divas had a drag fashion show. The United States of Asian America Festival has events here every year, as does the National Queer Arts Festival. Uh, and in recent years, Homies, Homies Organizing the Mission to Empower Youth, had one of their first large-scale neighborhood events here at SOMARTS. And I think of SOMARTS as being very multi-generational. Every time I've come here, I've seen artists who are emerging and young and community members that might be anywhere from in college to, you know, some of the old timers that have been around for a long time. I think that's pretty special about this organization. SOMARTS shows work by more than 1,000 Bay Area visual artists each year and collaborates through its programs with between 60 and 90 nonprofit cultural organizations each year. We host weekly figure drawing sessions every Saturday morning. There's a karate dojo that has classes three nights a week and people can drop in. And we have a free drop-in printmaking class for queer youth. Uh, we also have printmaking workshops for adults who want to learn their craft. We have an open studio. How do you see SOMARTS as distinguishing itself um, as a unique place and organization? I was just reading an interview with Elizabeth Streb. She's a choreographer based in New York. And she was talking about her vision for the spaces of the future uh, being 
rather than just being warehouse spaces, being a space where all kinds of participation on all levels is possible. And I think SOMARTS is already that space where artists at all levels of experience can be innovators, risk takers, can learn about other cultures, can find something unexpected, and, um, and we're a true alternative space in that we're welcoming to everyone. Some Arts Altars for the Spirits, Offerings for the Living isn't the only new show in town this month. Insights, 20 Years of Creative Vision, presented by the Arts Commission Gallery in partnership with the Lighthouse for the Blind. Insights is an annual juried exhibition of works by artists who are blind or visually impaired. The exhibition is located on the ground floor of City Hall, and the public reception is October 15th. The San Francisco Arts Commission's Immediate Future, the 2009 Murphy and Cadigan Fellowships in the Fine Arts Award Exhibition, provides a focused glimpse of what is being produced by promising artists attending regional graduate programs, and gives these emerging artists an opportunity to share their work with a wider audience. The opening reception is Friday, October 9th. Also save the date for Passport 2009, an annual fundraiser that invites the public to stroll through one of San Francisco's neighborhoods to create their own limited edition book by collecting passport stamps made by local artists. This year's neighborhood is the Mission District. Passport 2009 takes place on the afternoon of Saturday October 24th. For more information about purchasing a passport, visit sfartscommission.org slash gallery. The 2009 Art on Market Street kiosk poster program will begin on October 5th with a new poster series by watercolor artist Pamela Wilson Reichman, on view through December 31st between Van Ness and Embarcadero. The series, titled Taking In was inspired by archival photographs of people in city parks. Also, if you're a fan of the art on Market Street posters, we encourage you to visit the Bedford Gallery in Walnut Creek, where many of the posters from previous years are currently on view in an exhibition. For the first time ever, Writers Corps and the San Francisco Public Library, in partnership with Litquake and other youth organizations, are throwing teens an exclusive after-hours party. On the evening of October 16th, the main library will be open for teens only. For more information, visit writerscore.org. Also on October 17th, Writers Corps students will participate in the Litquake Lit Crawl. Visit litquake.org for more information. On the next episode of Culture Wire, we're taken to the streets with a look at the upcoming Wonderland exhibition and the Art in Storefronts pilot project. We'll also meet artist Christina Seeley, who has created large-scale banners installed in City Hall's North Light Court. We hope that you'll join the celebration this National Arts and Humanities Month by attending a local art event near you. Hopefully, we've given you a few good ideas. Next time, you can send us an email with your show ideas and tell us what you think about Culture Wire at culturewire at sfgov.org. Thanks for watching Culture Wire at SFGTV.